Hello, my friend. I'm glad to see you made it here today because we have gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. He's alive. He lives. It's good to see you here today. I'm glad to have you here with me as we're going over these 12 steps of recovery. If you haven't followed along, follow along. If you haven't seen the last few videos I've made, go back and check them out. Especially if you have experienced childhood abuse of some form or another back when you were a kid. You know, I, I make these videos and I produce these videos so that you may find hope. You, you may find restoration, you may find healing, you may find some information that is good for you. I mean, this world is full of information and you can find all kinds of different information there on the internet, but not everything is good for you. And I pray and hope these messages are good for you. So today we're going over the 10th and the 11th step of our 12 steps of recovery, which are all focused on and come from the teachings of the Bible. Self-control, the chrysopaths, right? Purity and holiness, the jacket, the crystal pad stone and the jacket stone. Self-control, that's one of the hardest things to do. And if you have a fracture within your foundation, and again, go back and watch the other videos to find out what we're talking about. But if you have a fracture inside of your foundation, is you know, have a fracture inside of your ability to display patience, or you have a fracture inside of your ability to display a sacrificial love or passionate love, if you have a fracture in your ability to display integrity or, or faith or to even believe in the faith of God, the integrity of God, the sacrificial love of God, the passionate love of God. These are some of the effects we can endure or occur when we are abused as children. The effects are, I can't believe in a good God who is spiritually good, is holy, cares about me, loves me. That's some of the effects. And it's heartbreaking to me, I produce these videos and when we start talking about these subjects, my following disappears. Nobody pushes the like button. Nobody shares the message. And it's so heartbreaking. It's so heartbreaking to me to be a part of a world that is utterly disgusting. I, I hate this world. There's many days I struggle to even wake up and be a part of this world because I, I hate it. And I, I hate it because of the human beings that live within it. And I struggle with that. I most definitely struggle with that. I struggle with Christians, fake Christians, who, who come and, and slander their neighbors, who uh, do everything they can to spread and speak lies while claiming they are Christians. People who neither have the ability to show or display any sort of integrity or self-control. You know, you, you'll meet many false Christians, many false people who, you know, want to control over everything and every aspect of another person's life, but they themselves totally lack self-control. Self-control comes from prudence. 
prudence is our ability or willingness to look at how our actions affect tomorrow or how our actions affect someone else. That's prudence. Uh, we can see that in the book of Proverbs, it talks a lot about prudence and having the ability to be prudent. That comes from our knowledge of good and evil, our, our knowledge of right and wrong. And, and people who lack self-control are usually addicted to something. We're addicted to alcohol, addicted to cigarettes, addicted to drugs, addicted to something. And don't know what your addiction is. And uh, I've also struggled with addiction throughout my life, smoking and other things. But somewhere in life, God gave me the ability to display a little bit of self-control and, and being able to abandon those addictions, those things that were hurting and harming me. So when we have no self-control, we're usually hurting and harming ourselves. Even if we have the ability to control over other people's lives, their actions, their feelings, their thoughts, their desires, we, we, if we lack self-control, we are hurting ourselves. And that can break down and destroy a relationship. You know, we can see self-control being displayed through Joseph, uh, one of the sons of Jacob. Right, as he goes and encounters the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh <clears throat> has him interpret a dream. We're going to have seven years of plenty, and then seven years of famine. And it really feels right, like that's part of our world. We have years where there is plenty, and then every time a Democrat gets into office, we have years of horrific famine. And it's up and down, up and down, up and down. You know, it's the devil tossing us in the wind like he's separating the chaff from the wheat. You know, we, we are constantly being beat down and broke down and, and abused by our government officials. They don't care for anything, and, and they have no ability at all to display self-control. They don't, they don't spend money in, without any control or thought to what's going on in our lives. And so it, it hurts people. People are always being hurt, and same goes for in your life. You know, Joseph says, if we display some self-control by putting 10% of all of the produce that is grown during the years of plenty will have more than enough to survive off of during those years of famine. And we can see within our world how that is not practiced. We can see within the Christian nation and the Christian world where those things are not practiced. Everybody wants to be a part of the non-profit organization so that they can avoid being taxed. But during the times of famine, during the times of need, they have no ability to tend to the needs of anyone. And they're always broke, right? Except for the preachers and the pastors who are sucking the system dry. Self-control comes from our ability to, to see the value in prudence, the, the, the value in self-love. 
self-preservation, loving our neighbors, and purity, holiness. You know, one of the greatest way to describe, describe holiness is through the life of Jesus Christ. So please get involved and into your Bible and look into the life of Jesus Christ because in it you will find a way of holiness. And having the ability to display great amounts of self-control. God has self-control. God is pure, pure in heart, pure in mind, pure in spirit. God is the essence of holiness. He is holy, holy, holy. That is the Lord our God. He is what defines holy. And, and if we want any thing to do with holiness, we, we should grab hold of, of Jesus Christ. We, if we want to display a heart of purity, we, we must enter into the kingdom of heaven. We must come to God as children, as a child. We see in the hearts of children, children five years old and younger, we, we see a a heart of purity and innocence about them. And it's tough as, as adults. It's tough when, when your innocence and, and the purity of you is raped and violated and, and abused as a child. And then we become adults. And how do we return back to that sense of purity? It's so difficult. That's why self-control, purity, and holiness are, are way down the list at number 10 and 11. They, they're extremely hard for us people to, to put our minds around, to grab hold of, to be a part of. It is not easy, you know, displaying faith it is a work. Believing God is pure at heart, it is a work. Believing God is holy, it is a work. Especially when you're living in an unholy, impure world. When you're living in a world where you're constantly being rejected and despised and in a world where you don't have any friends, your your only friend is you in a in a little room praying to God in in secret. That's that's your friend. It's it's, it's not an easy life, you know. Many people want you to believe that. Coming to Jesus Christ is the <clears throat> I don't know. Like everything's gonna disappear. All your problems are gonna disappear. All, all your uh, desires are gonna disappear. N none of it disappears. Nothing disappears. In fact, the closer you come to Jesus Christ, the, the closer you become like Jesus Christ the harder it is. A great story about purity and holiness is seen in the woman who sees Jesus inside of a Pharisee's house, right? And the Pharisees there are the religious leaders of that day. And this man's name is Simon, and there's Jesus is a guest within his home, and yet he never displays any love or gratitude or respect to Jesus while he's there in his home. You know, they bring him in to only mock him, to only question all of his motives and everything he's doing, but 
I didn't bring him into my home to offer him my hand in friendship. You know? And he's sitting there at the table and a woman comes in with uh, an alabaster box full of the good stuff begins crying over his feet, washing his feet with her tears and her hair. This is a, a display of purity. It is a display of holiness. Love your neighbors as you wished to be loved. And being obedient to that is a display of holiness. Instead of rejecting the man, instead of mocking the man, she receives the man as something good. Simon the Pharisee says, boy, if this man knew who that woman was, then, then he, he would surely be a prophet. I mean, how can he allow this sinner, this sick little bastard, to come and, and, and cry all over his feet? I mean, she's basic, basically worshiping this man as though he was a god. How disgusting. And boy, if he was a prophet, he would know where she had been last night. Jesus says to the man, you know, uh, let me ask you a question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and ask me that question. <laughs> you know. If there was two men and they came in to a banker, and one owed the banker $50,000 and the other owed the banker $5,000, and yet the banker said to both men, your debts are completely forgiven, they are completely wiped out, neither one of you owe me anything. You're free of debt, go your way. Which of the two would be most thankful Simon says the man who was forgiven the greater debt, the 50,000. Oh, you have answered correctly. Says to the woman, woman, your sins are forgiven. Stand up and go your way. You're forgiven. Your love has saved you. Your love has saved you. Having a, a heart of purity is a display of love and a willingness to, to love another person just as you were desired to be loved. And, Here's a woman who, who probably lived most of her life as being rejected, rejected as worthy, abused by men, abused by people of authority. This, this person is worthless. This person is a disgrace, disgusting and vile. Yet, Jesus says to her, your, your sins are forgiven, and uh, it's okay. He says, Simon, you know, this woman came into your house and washed my feet with her tears, dried them with her hair, and has anointed my feet with oil. You wouldn't even greet me with a kiss. You, you offered me no water to wash my hands or, or my feet. You, you, 
have been rejecting me and disrespecting me this entire time, and yet this woman has displayed love, love to the rejected, love towards the worthless. She has displayed a way of holiness. And how did she display that way of holiness? <clears throat> she believed Jesus Christ was worthy, worthy of love. She, he was worthy to be God's son. Another woman came in at, at a different time, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who was raised back to life. And another time also brought in a, a alabaster box with filled with pure nard, some of the most expensive perfume you, you could buy, especially back in that day cast you a whole year's wage and yet comes and cracks open that nard upon him and if you don't think that smell <laughs> illuminated the room you're crazy and not just the room but everywhere he went people would look and notice that 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 smell was unescapable Right, he cracked open the whole box over his head, and some of the disciples were upset. Why, why such waste? We could have sold that and fed the poor. Jesus says, the poor you will always have. You're, you're never going to get rid of the poor. It's impossible. It will always be there. But me, you will not always have. What this woman has done for me is beautiful. She believed. She believed in me. She believed in what I'm doing. She's preparing my body for the atonement that's about to come. And the atonement that's going to come is going to be a, a, a your benefactor. It's going to be beneficial for you. And she believed in it. She fully believed that he was the Christ. He, he was the son of the living God. That, that in him, his voice would ring out one day and all the dead would rise back to life. She believed in his authority. She believed in, in his power. Sometimes this is what displays a heart of purity and holiness, our willingness to, to believe in the love of God. And when you're abused as a child, that, that is extremely hard to recover from. That is extremely hard to overcome in life. To believe God loves you. To, to even believe God exists. Struggle to believe he exists, let alone loves me, cherishes me. You know, God had us on his mind before the creation of the world. And, and he found great pleasure in creating you, knitting you together within your mother's own womb. God, who in this world has ever taken the time to count every hair upon your head, yet God knows exactly how many hairs are on your head. We give value to animals and sparrows. How much more value does God 
display for us. We, we, we worry about where our next meal is going to come from. We worry uh, about our, our finances and, and our jobs. We, we worry about what clothing we should wear. We, we worry uh, about other people's opinions. But let us abandon those things so, so we may focus on, on the love that God has for you. God loves you. Jesus loves you. I mean, there's nothing in this world, there's nothing in this life that can display the love of God. The love of God for you it is so great, it can't be displayed here in this life. And that's for that reason he created heaven. Created heaven. A world where sin cannot enter. <laughs> A, a world, a, a place where death cannot enter. Sin and death are created from our inability to believe in God's love. I guess that's why we, we, we don't want to leave this world. We, we see this world as absolutely precious. Even though the most precious thing this world can offer us is death. We see it as precious because it is so limited. It can be taken away. We're here for just a short amount of time. And the older you get, the shorter Life really is, you know, as a child, as a young person, we think life is long. 80 years, 90 years, 100 years is a long amount of time and love to, to grab hold of them 80 years and, and make it our own. But when you're 75 and you're, and you're looking back, you, you really see just how short this life really is, and why, why waste our time in hating it, in hating each other? Why waste our time in all the things that are destroying it, that are destroying us? And, and I think the thing that destroys us most is our inability to believe God is pure at heart. God is holiness. That God displays self-control. God does not run around in fits of, of anger. He is not being tossed in, in the winds and the waves. God is in complete control. He's waiting for us to believe. The last stone, the last step of the 12 steps of, of this restoration of your life is the amicus stone. Gentleness. Being able to go out into the world with a gentle heart. You know, this is... If we've been abused as children, we know it's extremely hard for us to maintain sustainable relationships. It's extremely hard for us to engage in, in marriage because we're always upset 
We had to, can't display self-control. We can't display a sacrificial love or passionate love. Our integrity is broke down. When we slander our neighbors, we, we slander our spouses. We should, <clears throat> as husbands, do everything we can to protect the image of our wife. As wives, we should do everything we can to protect the image of our husband. And we're not talking outer images. We're, we're, we're talking about the inner image. Protecting our husband's confidence, our wife's confidence. Protecting the inner beauty that is displayed through a heart of purity and holiness. You know, having the ability to, to forgive one another, to love one another. Jesus says, I, I came to bring a sword and not peace to the earth. So there will never be peace on earth. We're never going to eliminate poverty. Because our very enemies are the members of our own household. And yet it's these enemies God has instructed us to love, to cherish, to care for. I mean, it takes a lot of self-control to be able to blast those who seek to persecute you. First thing I want to do when I meet my persecutor is lash out in anger. And you dirty dirtbag. And for some reason, it feels good to tell a dirtbag just how dirty they are. <laughs> And those are things I struggle with. They're, they're things we all struggle with. We, we all have issues. We all have problems. And it's for that reason we need Jesus Christ. He is our righteousness. He is our purity. He is our holiness. He is our forgiveness. He is our strength. He is. Therefore, we shall be still. We shall be calm. And we shall be at peace. We need Jesus Christ in our lives. And he is our faith. He is our love. And, and so sad to me. It's heartbreaking that there are people in this world that can't believe that. And Maybe one of the reasons they're unable to believe it is because of the things we're doing to them. You know? I don't know. It's nothing easy in this life. And it's not fair. Good people receive bad things. And bad people receive good things.
It's nothing fair. There's no reason for us to believe in a good God who loves us. No logical reason at all. But somehow, somewhere, I have the ability to believe in it. And my faith came from Jesus Christ himself, who said to me, go tell them, go tell you how much he loves you. And he showed me that love. He gave me a little bit of taste of what that love feels like, what it looks like, and what it really is. I can't even describe it. I have no way to display it. Jesus Christ loves you. He loves you so much. He laid down his life in order to gain you. God gave up everything he cherished Everything known as good. When we go through these 12 steps and we look at it and you put it all together, we, we, we as rational, thinking, logical people can say, yep, every piece of that is good. God says, I, I gave up everything I loved and I cherished, gave up everything this world knows as holy and good in order to gain you, in order to display to you love. That, that, that there's no other way to explain or describe the love of God and unless you've met Jesus Christ the Christ who was crucified for you. I gave up what I loved in exchange for you so that you would know the magnitude of his great love. God loves you. Our Heavenly Father loves and cherishes you and is using you to create a new temple, a precious temple chosen by God, built by God. You are a chosen precious stone rejected by men rejected by this world, yet chosen precious in the eyes of God, Christ being the capstone. Nevertheless, you are a living stone. You are precious in the eyes of God, and he loves you, and he cherishes you. And, and yes, in, in this world, there's no reason to believe in it. There is going to come a day when you will rise from the grave and you will be one with God and he will be one with you 
and together we will live in eternity in a place where fear does not exist decay and death have disappeared and sin is nowhere to be found God our Father has heard your prayers and he's coming soon.